Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. All the Christmas decorations are out. Everybody enjoying that, man? And everybody's got boxes in their living room and dining room that they meant to get up. And thank you for those of you who did get them decorated. I like looking at them. And I think I'm going to hire somebody to take ours down, though, you know? It's always cold to take them down. Like, wow, man. Anyway, Christmas is upon us. Hope you're enjoying it. And, uh, you know, keep your heart right. Don't get too discouraged with all the commercialism. That's going to happen. But enjoy it. Enjoy it with your family. You know, do things together. Form traditions. It's really a great season. We're blessed. You know, years ago, I had a, uh, we had some Chinese people staying with us. And they had Thanksgiving dinner with us. And uh, we showed them around the church and stuff. And I, I remember him asking me something that kind of caught me off guard. He said, I wonder, he said, why are all of the American holidays Christian? I thought, man, I was thinking, really? You think they're Christian? We're so mad about everything, you know? But he saw that all of our holidays were Christian. He said, you have Thanksgiving, you have Christmas, you have Easter. And I just thought, wow, man, even though we don't see it as much and we'd like to see it, still people do see it. it, it it's, they're, they're still Christian holidays. I mean, we're losing it, but hang in there, you know, and wish people Merry Christmas. So I think it keeps the holiday Christian, but it is a Christian holiday, and we are blessed that we have this holiday to celebrate as well as numerous others in our culture. It's really awesome. So anyway, this morning we're continuing our sermon series on God's will. Uh, we're looking at uh, numerous passages in the Bible where it clearly says this is God's will. I, I really, I'm enjoying this because this is just so clear and so foundational. Uh, we talked about a passage about giving thanks. Last week we talked about serving and uh, we'll talk about some more this week and next week. But the whole idea is that we're, 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 we're trying to discover God's will in our lives. This has got to be the million dollar question everybody asks. What's God's will for me? And even though these passages we're reading are what I would define as general passages, in other words, they're for every Christian, yet I believe if we incorporate them into our lives, if we adopt them, if we say, yes, this is God's will for me, and we seek to walk these out, I believe it's in them that we discover God's will for us personally. And it's not really that mysterious. It is day by day. But, but I think that you can discover God's will for your life personally as we look through these passages. So that's my hope here. And today we'll be looking at another passage found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, this is a topic I think you're all going to enjoy uh, because it talks about sex. And, uh, you know, this is a topic we all talk about at our homes, with our children, with our wives and friends all the time, right? in church. Is that weird? Is there something weird about this whole idea that we live in a culture that is so sex driven? I mean, every ad has got some sexual innuendo, it's sexual images everywhere, you know, comedians always having sexual humor, or sex ed, it's like, it's everywhere, it's everywhere, but, but talk about it? Nah, that's a little bit awkward, you know, so, uh, but, but you know what, the scriptures do talk about it, and it happens to be in the scripture we're reading today, and I think, gosh, you know, if anyone should be talking about sexual stuff, it should be the church, it should be Christians, because we'll get God's idea about it, if we don't, then we get everyone else's idea, we get TV, co you know, personalities telling us what they think about it, you get your friends, who many of them are all screwed up in their heads anyway, and they're telling you what they think about it, and and, you know, you get these weird ideas. So, so hopefully this morning we'll learn something about God's view. But, but the idea is this is discovering God's will. If you want to know God's will, this has to be resolved. You have to get a feel and an understanding what this is about. So if you have your Bibles, let's read 1 Thessalonians. And we'll read uh, chapter 4, verse 3. Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, For this is the will of God. So again, if you're sitting there wondering, what is God's will for my life? Well, here's an answer for you. This is God's will, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. The next verse develops it a little bit more, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So this, this is... Paul's teaching that if you want to discover God's will for your life, we need to get this figured out. And he's talking about sanctification here. So maybe we could spend some time this morning and discover what that means. First of all, if Paul says this is the will of God, your sanctification, then whatever sanctification means, would it be fair to say it must be possible? 
right? I mean, Paul says, this is God's will for you, that you be sanctified. Then it would be fair to say, well, then it must be possible. It must not be impossible. It must be something I can experience. It, it's, is it even possible that that's part of my everyday life? Yes. It has to be, or this is a ridiculous comment. This would be like, you know, this is God's will for you. It'll never happen, but hey, you know, it's still God's will. Give it a try. If you don't give up, move on. No, this is God's will. It must be possible. So what does he mean by sanctification? Well, whenever I'm reading the Bible, I try to stay really, really simple. I, I, I'm not a, what I would define as a Bible theologian, although I've read through the Bible 30, 40 times. I've taught through at least five or 10 times. I've memorized huge passages of scripture. I'm not a theologian because I don't know the Hebrew and the Greek, and sometimes I don't know about other things like that about the Bible. But I don't think you have to be a theologian to understand scripture, and I'm not intimidated when people say, well, what do you think that word means, sanctification? I try to read what it says. So maybe we could just keep it right in context here, this is God's will, your sanctification. Then you say, Paul, what do you mean by sanctification? Well, there it is, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Wow, that's the definition of sanctification. Now, it's fine to look up the Greek and to try and do studies of words. Sometimes that really helps. Sometimes I do that, and it really does expound and open up passages of Scripture. But this is pretty simple. Anybody here missing this? I mean, is there something over your head that you can't grasp when you say the word sanctification? Because that's kind of a religious word. You know, I don't know how many of us even use that in your everyday life. Hey, how you doing? You sanctified today? You know. How you doing, brother? You sanctified? What? You sanctified, justified, glorified, deified, specified, and sand aside? I don't know, you know. It's not a word you use. It just isn't. But it is a biblical word, and it does mean set apart. It doesn't only mean sexual purity, but in this context, this is what Paul's saying. Sanctification is sexual purity. Remain pure. You know, some of the Bible words are a little intimidating. You know, sanctification is like, wow, I, I don't get, you know, get, it means set apart. Uh, it means living a holy life to God. Uh, it is different from like a word you might hear justified or justification. Sanctification has to do with your behavior. Justification has to do with what God did for you. So they're a little bit different. Justification happens to you when you're born again and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You're justified. It happens. You didn't do anything. Sanctification is your behavior, your, your conduct, your character, how you walk out your life. Are you living a sanctified life? And, and I believe it only happens with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's not something you can just do of your own you know, determination. Sanctification is living with God's Holy Spirit and making decisions to say, I'm going to live a holy life unto God. So here Paul is saying, listen, if you want to know God's will, one of the things you have to get figured out is how to live a sanctified life how to live a sexually moral life. So what, what we need to understand is what, is what does that mean? You know, what does the Bible say about sexuality? And, and I think maybe we could start out with this. The Bible clearly teaches that sex is good between a husband and wife. You know, it's not just found in the book of Genesis, but there are passages all through the Bible. I mean, if you, if you don't know this, maybe read the book of Proverbs, chapter 5. There's a couple of verses there that clearly tell you that sexual relation between a husband and wife is pleasurable and it's good. And if you've never read the Song of Solomon, the book of the Song of Solomon, man, it's all about sexual relations. And I, it, it amazes me that people will read that and say it's all symbolic. It, it can be symbolic, but it's literal. Chapter 4, very graphic stuff in there about a relationship between a husband and wife. And so, you know, God's not anti-sex. And when you talk about sex, and people get this idea that Christianity and God and the Bible is anti-sex. You know, that, that sexual relations are only for reproduction and nothing else. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there are two main reasons for sexual relations between a husband and wife. One is for reproduction. It's actually the first command that God ever gave. But the second one is for pleasure, that husband and wife might enjoy one another. And yet the Bible is clear that sexuality and sexual relations are to be reserved between a husband and a wife. And, and sometimes there gets to be some confusion here because when we talk about sexual, sexual relations, we think of intimacy. And yes, it is intimacy, but sometimes people get this confused. It, relations between a husband and wife were never meant to replace the intimacy that we can only have with God. 
Sometimes husbands or sometimes wives put this pressure on each other. There's this need, this craving, and we think our spouse can meet that need. No, they cannot. They will never meet that deep need for intimacy that we're all born with because that's a hole in our heart that only God can fill. It's sort of similar to what children never, some children never figure out, and that is they have this demand for the perfect mother or the perfect father, and, and mom and dad can never meet that need, and so they get frustrated, but the fact is no mom or dad can ever meet that need because only God, your father, can meet that need. At some point, you have to come to grips with that. It's the same thing in a marriage. Your husband, your wife's not going to meet every need you have. That's just not going to happen. But there is supposed to be a deep and an intimate relationship there. But I think that, you know, if you read the story of Genesis and the creation of Adam and Eve, don't you think it's interesting that the very first thing that happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned, you remember it says they realized they were naked and they made clothes for themselves. I always thought that's kind of amazing because, like, the first thing that happened and what that's telling us is dysfunction in sexual relations and husband and wife was the very first thing that happened when Adam and Eve sinned, and it's gotten worse since then. Adam, the devil got his foothold in there, and here's this perfect relationship, husband and wife, Adam and Eve, they sin immediately, they, there's something wrong, and they're dysfunctional, and it's been broken ever since. I mean, we have this incredible dysfunction in sexual relations. You know, we have this idea that guys are thinking about sex all the time, and that's wrong, and then we have this idea that ladies never want sex, and that's wrong. I mean, there's, there's, it's just chaos out there, and we're in this culture that's so perverted this that it's kind of hard to figure out, well, what, you know, what is, what is God's plan here? God's plan is that sexual relations are to be reserved between a husband and wife. It's pretty clear from Genesis all the way through Revelations. You cannot miss that. And every time that law is broken, there's consequences. But, you know, research after research after research, study projects, everyone I've ever read verifies that sexual relations between a husband and wife are the most fulfilling relationships that, that there are out there regarding sexual intimacy. I mean, there was a study I read years ago. It's out of the University of Chicago. And mind you, the University of Chicago, not a Christian college, okay? Far from it. They did a research project, and it was called Sex in America, found that monogamous means one man, one woman, conservative Christians reported the most physical satisfaction in sexual relations. Monogamous, conservative Christians. There are other studies which have taken a step farther. Conservative evangelical Christians who attend church once a week as a husband and wife have reported the best physical satisfaction in their relationships. Wow, that's sort of shocking because that's not what you hear and that's not what you see on TV. You know, we, we're told that, you know, this uh, passionate uh, animal instinct, uh, spur of the moment, sexual relation with a stranger, a neighbor, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, that's the most satisfying. It is not. Never has been, never will be. God's plan for sexual relations clearly taught relationship between a husband and wife, monogamous throughout life. That's God's plan. And it's there to have pleasure. It's not that, that God wants to rip us off. So maybe we could look at that. What, is, what does Paul mean by sexual immorality? I, I, I'm, I'm sort of amazed that we have to kind of go over this in our culture today, but man, there is so much confusion. You know, what would be considered sexual immorality? Well, let me list off a few of them for you. Engaging in sexual relations while dating is sexual immorality, okay? Uh, otherwise defined as going too far. That's sexual immorality. Uh, regardless of uh, what you hear and see, you know, when you defile your conscience, I don't think I need to list off what all that involves, but when you go against your conscience, which says this is wrong, you're committing sexual immorality. Living together before you're married, that's sexual immorality. It's breaking the laws of God, which again, I've said often, you can't break the laws of God. You break yourself trying to break the laws of God, but the phrase means, you know, breaking the laws of God. Any form of sexual intimacy outside of marriage is sexual immorality. I'm not sure I can come up with a complete list because it seems to be growing rapidly. You know, regardless of what our former president Bill Clinton said about his relationship, that was sexual immorality. If, you, if you're not familiar with that, go read up on it. But, but any sexual intimacy outside of marriage is sexual immorality. Sending explicit pictures to one another. I mean, these things that, you know, conversations that should not be had, you know, exciting the passions. The, outside of marriage, sexual intimacy is wrong. 
And then, of course, we have the big one, homosexuality. That's sexual immorality. I'm sad to hear and see. I know there's people here among us that have been deceived by, by all kinds of stuff and actually believe that homosexuality is a gift of God. That's wrong. It's, it's sinful, and it will cause destruction. Even though our Supreme Court has made it legal, it doesn't go against the Word of God. It's sexual immorality. And then, of course, there's the big one, pornography. You know, it's not as though pornography is anything new. You know, pornography has been around forever. But with the internet and computers and then laptops and then your mobile device, it has become unbelievably powerful in our culture today. And it's wrong. It just is wrong. And somehow we have to learn how to deal with this. But it starts with recognizing it's wrong. And pornography is not some victimless crime like I'm not hurting anybody. I mean, first of all, the ladies that are brought into this sex trafficking destroys their lives, destroys relationships you have with your spouse, finances get ruined, mistrust comes in. I mean, there's consequences to this. And, and, and you know, if we want to find God's will. I want to know God's will for my life. I have to deal with this. I cannot allow this to rule in my life. And, and I think there are ways you can deal with it. I mean, first of all, with your computer or your mobile device, put on that computer some kind of protection. Like, like there's programs out there. Some of them are free. Some of them you have to pay for. Triple X Church is one of them. Have that on my computer, have it on my mobile device. I actually have two of them on my computer mobile device. The other one's called for pure eyes only. I mean, this will protect you. You can sign up for that, and then it will track all your website journeys. And if you're visiting the wrong websites, each month it sends a report to somebody else. And if it's somebody you're accountable to and who can beat you up if you're messing up, then... Right? <laughs> you don't want to send it to somebody who just goes, oh, I'm so sorry. You want somebody to just whack you upside the head like you're in. Don't stop that, man. Give me that phone, you know. I've often said, mine goes to Roxanne, and she told me she's got a shotgun and a six-shooter, and <laughs> don't want to end too quickly just yet, you know. But deal with it, you know. We, I want, so you want to know God's will? Take a look at this thing and say, you know, this, here's the question. Is it possible to be free from this? Yeah. Doesn't mean you'll, you'll never be tempted, but it means you can live a sexually moral life if you're willing to make some decisions and deal with these things. They're out there. But, but I want to read a couple of other passages, then we're going to finish up. What, what we have to realize is that this whole thing starts in our head. James in his epistle talked about this, if you would turn to it. It starts in James chapter 1. Verse 14, But each one is tempted... When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So now this is, this is really kind of important here. James is telling us that the root of all sin starts in here, up here. We start thinking about things that are improper. We're, we're not controlling our thoughts. And the Bible says you can control your thoughts. You can do that. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you can gain control of your thoughts. The Bible says, cast down the wrong thoughts. Train yourself to think on things that are pure and holy and, and righteous and clean. And you can do that. But James says, if you don't, then that's where the sin starts. Actually, Jesus talked about this in the Gospels. When he was talking about sexual purity, he said, if a man looks after a woman to lust for her, he's committed sin. He's talking about sin of the heart. It starts in the heart. And, and if it's not dealt with, it will produce physical you know, activity. You'll follow those thoughts. If you don't get control of them, you're going to act them out. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that the sin of the heart or the sin of the mind has the same consequences as acting out sin. There's very different consequences. The sin of the heart or the mind is not going to produce as much damage as acting out those sinful thoughts in any area, especially in the area of sexual immorality. But it starts in the heart. And, and we have to learn how to gain control of our minds or our hearts and say, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to do that. And God, by your Holy Spirit, help me. But James has kind of taken us to a place saying it starts in the head, but you act it out. And then he says, and when you act it out, at the end of verse 15, it brings forth death. This is the whole thing we have to deal with when we ask the question, Paul's saying, this is God's will for your life, that you're sanctified, you live a moral life. Why? Why? 
Why should we live a moral life? Wouldn't it be more fun to live an immoral life? You know, people think that. The problem is, when you break the laws of God, there are consequences. And the whole idea, this is so healthy that if you could get this in your heart, you will understand basic Christianity. Like, this is 101, and that is, the laws of God are given to protect us, not to rob us. Especially young people growing up in Christian homes and in church, they don't get this, and they think the laws of God are there to rob us of happiness and joy. James is saying if you break the laws of God, it will bring forth death. The book of Proverbs, first couple chapters, talks about this. It brings forth death. Sexual immorality is no different than any sin, but it will bring... It, well, actually, it is, it's, a more, it's a more heinous crime because there's consequences that are more grievous. But the idea is that God says maintain the right standard for sexual relations and you won't experience this death. God's trying to prevent us from living a miserable life. God's trying to prevent us from hurting ourselves and hurting other people. The consequences of not living a sanctified life, the list is just huge. I mean, it's diseases, there's mistrust, there's financial ruin, there's divorces, there's abortions, there's, there's broken emotions and lives that are destroyed. That's what God's trying to prevent us from experiencing. So when he's saying, you know, live a sanctified life, he's not saying you're not allowed to enjoy the pleasures of sexual relations, but do it within his context, which is within the marriage between a husband and wife. Outside of that, James says, you're going to bring forth death. These are results that will cause severe uh, destruction in people's lives. So I want to finish up with one more passage, and that is, Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 because I think Paul kind of really addresses this whole idea here in Ephesians chapter 2. And this is the idea. Sexual sin can be forgiven and the fact is we've all been there. We've all been there. Like the person sitting on the right of you and the person sitting on the left of you, they're a sinner. Just like you, just like me, really. This is what Paul's saying here in chapter 2. There's no way to beat yourself up here. It's to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're all dealing with this. Chapter 2, verse 3. Paul says, Among whom we all, all of us, once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, children of wrath just as the others. So is there anybody excluded when he says, among whom also we all? Anybody here not part of that? We all. You, me, person on the right of you, person on the left of you, person in front of you, person... We all, Paul said, have fallen trapped to this kind of stuff. None of us have been pure. Well, where does that leave us? Paul says, wait a minute, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved so dealing with sanctification we've all been there breaking the laws of God we've all had immoral thoughts we've all some of us have acted them out some of us have not acted them out but we've all broken these laws Paul said we've walked in the fulfillment of the lust of our flesh We've broken these laws of God, so what's, where does that leave us? Well, John, uh, Paul says, wait a minute, God who's rich in mercy, God, you know, he's able, he's got great love, and, and even though we've messed up, he's here to give us grace and compassion. There is, there is restitution, There's, there, you can be, re, you know, returned. God can restore us. One of the problems with sin, and especially with sexual sin, is it's so condemning. I mean, it, it, you know, the problem with sin is it steals hope from us. When we fall into sin, let's say you have a problem with alcohol, you have a problem with anger, you have a problem with pride, whatever it is, and you find yourself falling into it, at some point you just want to give up. You say, I can't, I can't win, but that's the lie of the devil. You can win. And when it comes to sexual immorality, there's this fear like, I, I've you know, I've gone too far, there's no hope for me. But there's no sin that's beyond the reach of God's grace. You know, God can restore us. I mean, we have to do certain things. I, I think, you know, you have to confess that it's sin. 
you know, this is the problem we're dealing with and with much of the sin today. We have people who are behaving in improper ways because they know God forgives them, but the, but the point is they're not asking God to forgive them. They think it's okay. You can't do that. that that's, that's what I would call presumptuous sin. That's crossing a line. You have to admit, this is wrong. I'm sorry, God. Forgive me. Confess it. Ask God to forgive you. But I think the other thing is you have to take responsibility to say, I'm going to try and change. And whatever that looks like, do it. You know, for each of us, there's different things we need to do. Maybe you need to join a group. Maybe you need to sign up for something. Maybe you need to get in a conversation with somebody. Maybe you need, whatever it be, but take responsibility and say, I'm going to do something to change. Because if we give our best, I'm convinced God will show up and add to that. When we give up, he can't do much. But if we do your best, you commit it, God brings the rest. There's always hope. So, so when we're talking about, you know, in summary here, we're talking about finding the will of God. Every one of us, we want to know the will of God. I want to know the will of God for my life every day. I know from, in my life, I know from a young age, I felt called to pastor. But, but what does that mean? How do I walk that out? I have to discover that every day. It doesn't matter if you know your career calling, if you found it. You still have to know God's will for your life today. How do you walk that out today? Well, part of discovering that is learning what these passages are talking about. And today we're talking about this is God's will, your sanctification. Abstaining from sexual immorality, making a decision, I'm not going to go down that path. Now, I know, you know, you talk about this kind of stuff, there's people here, all kinds of stuff going on in their head, you know. Somebody here beating themselves up. I, I, you know, I made some bad decisions. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure of that. There's some people that have acted on those bad thoughts. Some people haven't. But, but, you know, let's realize that we're all in the same boat here. There really isn't anybody in this room who can say, not me. I mean, this is sometimes confusing because people come into the church and they look around and they think, everybody in this church is just so holy and so righteous and yet I'm the sinner. And, you know, and sometimes that even keeps them away from church. Like, well, I shouldn't go there. I'm a hypocrite. Wait a minute. We're all here. We all have fallen into this kind of stuff, but we're learning how to gain victory. We're learning what does it mean to be forgiven by God. And we live each day asking him to give us the strength to make the right decision. There's always hope. And I truly believe God can give you the wisdom that you need to make the changes. And, and, you know, do what it takes. Talk to somebody, pray, get involved. I, put stuff on your computer to protect you. Uh, don't, you know, in dating relationships, don't put yourself in situations which you just know you're going to lose, man. You know, be, be honest about it, and you can live a life of sanctified living. And that will help you discover God's will for your life. Let's close in prayer. God, I know that uh, you created each one of us for a purpose. And, and there's a hunger inside of us to know that purpose, God. What, what, what have you created us for? What are our gifts and talents? How can we use them? What, what do you want us to do with our lives? But I believe, God, you've given us some clear, clear instructions in your word where it says clearly, this is your will we live lives of giving thanks, that we live lives of serving others, and that we live lives of sanctified living regarding especially sexual morality, God. Give us a biblical understanding of healthy sexual relations, God. This is not for us to be telling other people what to be doing, but God, that we would know what is right so that we could live a blessed life. And give us, God, the ability to control our thoughts. God, where we need help, God, give us the strength and the confidence and the courage to reach out. I thank you, God, that, that sanctification is possible. It is possible by your strength and your help, God. take a moment here as we're just praying. I, I, God, I pray for individuals here that are struggling this morning. I, I just know that, God, there's some people that are in relationships that they need help with, God, and I know there are people that are struggling with controlling their thoughts and pornography and relations outside of marriage. And, 
Holy Spirit, I pray right now, by your, by your presence, God, just shine your light there. Drive out the darkness. Drive out the despair. Replace it with hope, courage. Remind us, God, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We hold on to that, God. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand? We're going to take our offering at this time. So we have our prayer team up front here. I just uh, really sense the presence of the Holy Spirit here right now. I just, man, hearing those words, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. It's Holy Spirit, we, we don't want to be in bondage. Thank you for your power to break chains in our lives, God. Just come, Holy Spirit. Just come break those chains, God. Some people here bound in chains of fear, depression. Some people bound with chains of anger, uncontrollable anger. Some people bound with chains of poverty that have just been generational, some of these things. Alcohol, chains of smoking, all kinds of bondages. Holy Spirit wants to break them today. Brought us here to, to rise up within us that power that, that came, that rose Jesus from the dead. The Bible says, same Holy Spirit dwells in us. Same Holy Spirit to break chains in our lives. So we're going to close with a song here. We just invite you forward. If you've got some stuff you'd like some prayer for, maybe it's a chain of sexual immorality. You just need to get a handle on that or I also got a couple of words, just physical healing, people just accepting diseases as though this is your lot in life. I, I got this ringing in my ear thing. Somebody who's had this for a long time, it comes and goes, but when it comes, you get this thought, well, this is, this is my lot in life. It isn't. It isn't. Got a picture of somebody with pain behind their eyes, like, like a headache, but, but maybe caused by the eyes. Also somebody's stiffness in their hands. So if you have needs this morning, part of why we're here is to meet with God and to encounter his presence in, in a tangible way. So we're closing in with a song. If you have need for prayer this morning, we've got people up front that love to pray with you. Jesus. I would rather be than hearing
just thank you so much for your presence here. God, thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. We just love you so much. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Just go in peace and we'll see you next Sunday.